This is another, long, boring, math video. Its purpose is not to entertain, but to educate. If your only experience has been to watch a couple of videos on the Collatz conjecture, then this video is not for you. It involves advanced mathematical concepts related to the conjecture. It is intended for those math enthusiasts with a hands-on working knowledge attempting to solve the Collatz conjecture. The target audience for this video varies from casual mathematicians, up to math professors. The reason for making a video, rather than publishing a technical paper, is that students, teachers, and professors must pay publishers large amounts of money to download a paper, of which I the author, receive none of. By making a mathematical video, copyright law states that schools, colleges, and universities may freely use this video, in part, or in whole, for the education of their students, and faculty members, but cannot do so for profit. For example, as a visiting paid lecturer, a professor cannot use this video for that event. Now that is out of the way, did you come here to learn more factual information about the Collatz conjecture? Good. Because this video will give you facts that are verifiable, and the information is easily recreated so you can verify the information for yourself. Now if you have a good understanding of high school mathematics, you can follow and understand this video. Most importantly you have to understand, it is not the math that makes this an advanced video, it's the patterns they reveal. If you have studied the Collatz conjecture some of the patterns are obvious and in your face. Others are not. I intend to show you these patterns, and hindsight being 2020, they all will seem obvious. Okay. For you hardcore mathematicians there will be trivial patterns. Because of the breadth of my audience, these trivial patterns will be shown, but do not worry, the good stuff is coming. Fundamentally, this is modular arithmetic, but we are using it at its most basic form, the form you used in elementary school. For this video this is all you will need to know. The problem with running a program, or getting a dump from a database, is that it is hard to see how to organize the raw data in a meaningful way. Poorly organized data can be visually chaotic, and mask the patterns you are looking for. But once a pattern has been found, they become essential tools to further our understanding. I will not be making my spreadsheets publicly available, as the point of this video is that the information can be recreated and is verifiable. For those wishing to recreate the spreadsheets, you require an intermediate skill level. Also, the note about large numbers on a spreadsheet is so you know that it is a serious problem. For you who do not know, spreadsheets write large numbers in scientific notation, and there is a maximum number of decimal places used before they are rounded or truncated. Once this happens, they are useless to us, as they now disrupt the patterns. In my case, that was numbers greater than 10 to the 10th. Collatz has reportedly been checked with numbers up to 3 times 10 to the 20th. Numbers way too big for spreadsheets. So, all the numbers we will be dealing with are known to go to 1. The compressed notation is great if you are interested in stopping times, we are not. We need the raw data from Collatz to find patterns. I cannot stress how important this is. I am a casual mathematician, who, while watching videos on the Collatz conjecture, wondered why are they doing this. These videos were based on research of the hailstone effect or stop times. I thought this was crazy. To me they were looking at the chaos to find patterns, instead of using the math to find what was causing the chaos. Collatz is not random even though it may appear so. It is deterministic. Take an odd number multiply it by 3 and then add 1 gives you a result. Take that same odd number multiply it by 3 and then add 1 you get the same result. 
deterministic, not random. And while it has a chaotic look there are patterns that account for that chaos. The problem. I was unable to find the information I was looking for, hence the title of this video, Little Known or Undocumented Facts. I had to recreate all this information on my own. Let me make myself clear, I do not believe any of this is new or original work, but making this video does make me Columbus. Teachers of math, and because of this video, that includes me, are all the same. They look at what they are teaching, determine what is important, and what is trivial, and then they teach what they think you need to know. Thinking that the trivial is obvious, or unimportant, which for you is neither. Some information is so important that it is kept as a secret. What I mean by that is if you were a mathematician, who learned or discovered information that allowed you to solve a Millennium Prize problem, you would probably keep it a secret until you published the paper that would award you a Fields Medal in Mathematics, plus put a million dollars in your pocket. But the information here, I believe, is buried in a notepad deep in some desk, or in a book on an overlooked dusty old shelf. So, if you are a professor of mathematics, and think this is new or original information or work, I am going to assume that you are a Viking from the wrong clan. If you have any practical working knowledge of Kalats, you understand these statements. Information that is rarely stated because it is in your head. Information most of us understand, but have deemed unimportant. Here we see a vertical stack of the odd numbers, and when we multiply by 3 and add 1 to each of them, we get an even number, but there are gaps between the even numbers. The gapped even numbers cannot be created with 3 and plus 1. You can reach any even number by dividing its double by 2, but only certain even numbers can also be reached by 3 and plus 1. Of course, you can reach any odd number by dividing its double by 2, but because odd numbers create even numbers this makes them special, very special. It is at this point most people stop investigating any further. Everything we see here validates our original three statements and emphasizes the importance of 3 and plus 1. If you have a working knowledge of collats, you know the importance of the intersection of the even and odd numbers. So why is it the lock? If you have seen a standard collats tree, at 16 the tree splits at 5 and 32. By definition 16 is the branch point and 5 is the branch. We do not define 32 as it is unimportant. Why? Because of the unpredictability of dividing by 2. Randomly selecting an even number and dividing by 2 may, or may not, result in a branch point. Whereas randomly selecting an odd number will always result in a branch point. Hence, why it is sometimes called the 3 and plus 1 problem. I was just like everyone else thinking all was good, until, one day, while staring at a collat tree, I realized, 3n plus 1 acted as disruptor to the pattern of dividing by 2. Then it happened. I made the intuitive leap. The key to collats is, the even number table. As we discussed, you can take any odd number, and it results in a specific even number, but the important part is where dividing by 2, and 3n plus 1 achieve the same results. Unfortunately dividing any even number by 2 will not result in this outcome. This inevitably turns everyone's focus to 3 and plus 1. Regrettably, the key to understanding the very basics of collats is recognizing the importance of dividing by 2. We can randomly select any even number and divide it by 2, and the results will be even or odd. So. It is human nature for us to ask if given an odd number, what do I have to divide by 2 to achieve that odd number? And you can easily answer that question. But we should also apply that question to the even numbers. Most people would stop right here, but we can take this further.
we need to take this further. Understanding the importance of dividing by two, gives us the key to the kingdom. Remember, Collatz is deterministic, not random. The results of the function are specific numbers, and like 5 this should work for any odd number. Obviously, this makes sense, but it has a much deeper implication. Are you ready? This statement tends to blow most people's minds when they first see it. Some believe it is not true, but just stop and think about it for a minute, and you will realize that the statement is, in fact, true. Here is the even number table. It is millennia old, and predates Collatz by quite an excessively huge margin, and like the multiplication table, it is a mathematical axiom represented in a visual format. Virtually everybody is taught the multiplication table. I was taught the even number table in high school by a fellow student, and not by a teacher. One of the reasons it is not generally taught to students is, that by the time you grasp multiplication, the even number table is seen more as a novelty. It is an interesting concept, rather than a useful mathematical tool. But, the even number table is absolutely the right tool for the Collatz conjecture. Bottom line is, you only have to prove, all odd numbers reach 1. Why? Because all even numbers will reach an odd number. Rows, are normally number 1, 2, 3. These rows are labeled by the odd numbers only. In the spurt of a collatz tree, we will call them branches. The second part of the definition we will come back to in a moment. The columns are designated by the exponents of 2. Also note that the exponent tells how many times you need to iterate dividing by 2 to reach an odd number. The trunk versus branch 1 will be explained later. Branch points are self-explanatory. Dead branches are self-explanatory, but with be easier to understand in a moment. For jump point just count slash label from left to right for each branch. This will be easier to understand in a moment. Okay, the second part of the definition of a branch is the odd number processed through the 3n plus 1 function. Please note, that the resulting even number is the branch point. These two functions are not the same. 3n plus 1 divided by 2 is the compressed notation normally used for stop times. The other is the optimally compressed notation. The critical difference is, you continue to divide by 2 until you reach an odd number. Making it a quick way to get from one odd number to the next. Please note that the odd number inputted will never be the same as the outputted odd number. C, is a number provided to you, to start an iterated process through a function with an explicit task in mind. In our case to make a sequence of numbers. Here is an example. While not shown here, there will always be a source that provides C. Notice that, not only is C the lead number of the sequence, but it is also the number used to start generating the iterated process. We need to understand how to convert an even number back to an odd number. This is done by simply reversing the 3n plus 1 process. But as we know, this does not work for all even numbers. The highlighted numbers are all the even numbers that can be converted back to an odd number. By definition, these are the branch points. Notice that there are no branch points on some branches. Their even numbers are multiples of 3. 
subtracting 1 from a multiple of 3, and then dividing by 3, will result in getting a remainder of 2. Therefore, no branch which is a multiple of 3 will have branch points. This is the difference of two numbers, but notice it is the same as multiplying the even numbers of branch 3 by 2. This pattern is more important. Once you have found the first branch point of each branch, you can keep multiplying by 4 to find all the other branch points. But finding the first branch point can be a problem. For branch points in column 2, all you have to do is multiply the branch by 4. Unfortunately, this does not work for column 1. Instead, you must multiply by 2. So, how can we tell if the branch points start either in the first or second column? It's really quite simple, you divide the branch by 3, and evaluate the remainder. Here is an example. By converting the multiples of 2 and 4 into exponents of 2, it will help identify the column. Alternatively, you can just remember the column is the opposite of the remainder. If remainder is 1 then column 2. Remainder is 2, column 1. Now we want to find an easy way to identify if a branch point is associated with a dead branch. To do that, we are going to add to what we already know. Remember that M is the even number branch point, and N is the odd number branch. And we simplify it to this formula. Here we identify the distribution of the dead branches. Of course, there is a pattern to this. It is replicated both horizontally, and vertically. On any branch, once you have identified the first dead branch, it is easy to identify the next. Unfortunately, it is much more difficult to identify the first dead branch. If we look at the number 10, we know it is the result of multiplying 5 by 2 to the first power. If we look at the trunk, it has all the powers of 2 displayed as their whole number value. We end up with a unique pattern we have to deal with. What we do not have to deal with are, branches which are a multiple of 3, as they are dead branches. Here is our repeating pattern F. But notice the pattern does not start with 64, but instead H. This is how we will accommodate all the number offsets. Here you can see when F equals H, and again when the pattern repeats. This is our offset. This rule is telling us that we can now start multiplying by 64. Here is our complete table. This is the same table, but replacing branch points for branches. The reason for me showing this, was so you would understand the next couple of charts. This is the branch point table, and while this is useful, the reference table is what we really need. I used this a lot. But let's face it what you are really interested in is this. The even number table, shows you the dispersal of the even and odd numbers for the Collatz conjecture. This is just the first part of the chaos that abounds with this conjecture. There is one other. And while it seems that we have chaotic behavior, there is still order.
it is time that I explain the difference between branch 1 and the trunk. The Collatz tree normally starts like this. Notice how the split for 5 and 32 disrupts the continuation of the pattern of multiplying by 2. I would like to change that so that it is more in line with my thought process. Let's select one, and calculate its orbit. The next odd number is 3, so let's calculate its orbit. We see they have similar characteristics, so let's merge them. This is an input tree, and differs slightly from a standard Collatz tree. With a standard tree, you would end up with even numbers on the dead branches. But, as an input tree we only use the odd numbers. Here, we used the odd numbers, up to and including 21. Look at branch 5. As we input more numbers the larger the branch grows. And this is true of all branches except one. That, being branch 1. As more numbers are added, the branch doesn't grow, but the trunk does. I do not care if you interchange branch 1 and the trunk, I do it all the time, just so long as you understand, there is a technical difference. Remember when I said, teachers teach what they think you need to know. Thinking that the trivial is obvious, or unimportant, which for you is neither. I found myself constantly explaining what I meant about branches. Repeating or re-explaining yourself is not a reflection of a poor student, but that of a poor teacher. This time I am going to explain it while giving visual guidance. As they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and in this case they are right. This is the even number table. It shows how the even numbers of the Collatz conjecture are dispersed. We have highlighted all the branch points. Every even number branch point has an associated odd number branch. Look at 16. If we reverse 3n plus 1 we can find the associated odd number branch. So, we subtract 1, and then divide by 3 the resulting odd number, is 5. The reason I am explaining this is, that some people were not making the connection between. This 5 is representing, branch 5. Which is why, they are both called branch 5. This works for any odd number on any branch. Even dead branches. Why do we care about dead branches? To prove the Collatz conjecture you must prove, all odd numbers reach 1. Collatz is deterministic, not random. Multiplying an odd number by 3, and adding 1, gets you a specific even number. Which brings us back to the second definition of a branch. The odd number, representing the branch, is processed through the 3n plus 1 function, and the resulting even number is the branch point. A specific branch point. We now have to introduce the concept of branch value. Branch 1 has a value of 1. Branch 5 has a value of 5. Branch 13 has a value of 13. We have proven that any even number on branch 1, and iterating the process of dividing by 2, will reach the value of 1. That any even number on branch 5 will reach the value of 5, and of course any even number on branch 13 will reach the value of 13. But the even numbers that we are most concerned about are the branch points. Because odd numbers representing a branch is linked to a specific branch point. Which means all the odd numbers on branch 1, will reach the value of 1. All the odd numbers on branch 5, will reach the value of 5, and all the odd numbers on branch 13, will reach the value of 13. 
This is what makes this table important. Because all the odd numbers on branch 5 will reach the value of 5, and 5 is represented on branch 1, it means all the odd numbers on branch 5 will reach the value of 1. Likewise, because all the odd numbers on branch 13 will reach the value of 13, and 13 is represented on branch 5, it means all the odd numbers on branch 13 will also reach the value of 1. Continuing this process will create a collats input tree. Here is the even number table. The branches, the odd numbers, are on the left, and act as the rows. The columns are represented by powers of 2, and are along the top. We are going to flip this table on its side. First, we are going to remove information we don't need. Next, we will rotate the numbers 90 degrees to make them easier to read, and highlight the branch points. As 3 is a dead branch, it has no branch points. Now, we must make some room. We know that branch 1 is actually the trunk, so let's reflect that. On the trunk, the next branch point is at 16. By now you should know it is associated to branch 5. When I say that, I literally mean it is associated to branch 5. On branch 5, the first branch point is 10. The branch associated to it is branch 3. The next branch point is 40. The branch associated to it is branch 13. On the trunk, the last branch point is 64, and it is associated to branch 21. Again, branch 1 being the exception to the rule. Now that you know what I mean by branches, I need you to start looking at them with that kind of lens in place. That a branch literally represents an entire branch, that branches have branches, that have branches, which also have branches, that continue adding a never-ending set of new branches. Here are the branch points. Here are the branches. Note that when it comes to branch or branch point tables, we are not concerned with the offset. Meaning whether the first branch or branch point starts in column 1 or column 2. There is a difference on how you look at these tables. On the branch point table, you go from branch point to branch point to get to the bottom. Similar to taking the stairs floor to floor in order to reach the bottom. Whereas on the branch table, you bypass all the other branches to get to the bottom. It is like taking the express elevator to the bottom. These are the jump points. In the end, the most important thing to understand is the branch table. Before, I showed you the reference tables I built, but you cannot have a reference table for all numbers. Sometimes you need to get down and dirty and build a branch or branch point table for a single odd number. For simplicity's sake, we will use the number 1. The first step is performing the starting branch point test. Because the remainder is 1, we know it starts in column 2. Since the column number represents the powers of 2, we multiply x by 2 to the power of 2 to get an even number, m, the first branch point. Once we have the branch point, m, we can convert it back to an odd number, n, giving us the first branch. When you find out which column the first branch point is in, 
if it is even, all branch points will be even. The same thing applies if it is odd. This will come important when looking for dead branches. Now that you have M and N, you can use the appropriate formula to iterate the proper sequence for branch points and branches. If you remember, there are six offsets where a dead branch could start. Luckily, half are in even columns, and half are in odd. That means we only have to check the first three numbers in the sequence to find a dead branch. Also, because collats is deterministic and not random, there are only three possible sets of patterns we need to check for dead branches. And, it does not matter whether columns are even or odd, as they both follow the same patterns. Because of this, we only have to test the first number, M, or N, which, fortunately, is the smallest number in the sequence. Which comes in handy when using very large numbers. When we do a dead branch test, if the remainder is zero, the first number in the sequence is a dead branch. If the remainder is 1, the third number in the sequence is a dead branch. If the remainder is 2, the second number in the sequence is a dead branch. Of course, now that you found the first dead branch, you can use it and the appropriate formula, to find the rest. Or, just mark every third number that comes after that as a dead branch. Here are the branches associated to the trunk. Of course, branch 1 being the exception. This 5, as you know, represents branch 5. And this applies to 21, which is a dead branch. And to 85. And as we are running out of room, we will be using an abbreviated links for branch 341 and branch 1365. but the abbreviated links can be applied to all branches. And like 13, they represent actual branches. If we tried to show all the actual branches, we would end up with a modified collats tree, and this is a good thing. Why? Because as I previously stated all this information is verifiable. Meaning you can use a standard collats tree as a means of verification. It may look different, but all the data is there. The indefinite branches, connecting to branches, comes with a deeper meaning when looking at how collats may be disproven. One way to disprove collats is with a loop. But since no current loops have been found when n is a positive integer, we will instead let n be a negative integer. When n is negative, there are three known loops, negative 1, negative 5, and negative 17. Like positive 1, the negative 1 loop is considered trivial. We will instead concentrate on the negative 5 loop. As you can see, there are only two odd numbers in the loop. Let's look at their branch points.
Let's rearrange them and connect the loop. This shows you the branch points and the proper location of the branches, but I would prefer you looked at it like this. I need you to understand that the negative 5, negative 7 loop is not isolated. That there are an indefinite number of branches that are linked to this loop. All of them separated from the negative 1 tree. This of course is already known, but is important enough to re-emphasize as it is a very crucial step at how we look at things going forward. Because the minus one loop has only one odd number in it, it creates an independent tree. If we think of minus five and minus seven as independent trees, then none of the branches on tree minus five will be on tree minus one. As well as none of the branches on tree minus seven will be on tree minus one. We can also say the same for tree minus five, none of its branches will be on tree minus seven and none of the branches on tree minus 7 will be on tree minus 5. With one exception. Because tree minus 5, and tree minus 7, are interdependent trees, an interdependent tree will be a branch on a connected tree. The connected branch does not have to be the lowest branch on the tree. You can clearly see this when you map out the negative 17 loop. Here, you can see that tree minus 5, is a branch on tree minus 7. And, that tree minus 7, is a branch on tree minus 5. But this is a simple loop. For 3n plus 1, a loop would have to be unbelievably, and spectacularly, enormous. This is how you were taught to think of loops. But this is how you need to look at loops. Looking at them as interdependent trees, gives you a better sense of scale. This is especially important when you think of a loop for 3n plus 1. Based on my extremely rough estimate, the number of interdependent trees would be in the tens of billions. Which brings us to the next point, steps. The other way to disprove the conjecture is a run of numbers that continue upward indefinitely. I call the process steps for short. And this is how they would like you to think of them, but you now know to think of them as interdependent trees. You can pick any tree, and from it any branch, of a branch, of a branch, and its path will fall, no matter how far, to the root of the tree, and then begin an indefinite climb upward. Of course, this too is already known, just not generally taught. But again, by looking at them as interdependent trees gives you a better sense of scale. Understanding the link between the dispersal of the collats numbers, and the even number table is important. But, Anyone who has worked trying to understand collats understands the importance of the powers of 2. If I didn't show you the link to the even number table, eventually someone else would have. In fact, another YouTuber has. Unfortunately, that video link was unavailable at the time of this recording. While I came upon this independently on my own, the truth of the matter is, as I discovered later, it had already been evolving in other YouTube videos but no one had put all the pieces together until his video. Unfortunately, he was able to beat me to the punch. One of the reasons why was what we did after making this discovery. Like I said, division by two, is the key to understanding the Collatz conjecture, and what is coming next, seems not to be known to anyone. Better yet, it is more likely that anyone who does know it is not sharing. I am. I am Columbus.
Look at how the even numbers are dispersed. If you select 64, and then all the highest numbers less than 64 from each column you get this pattern. Notice the numeric pattern. What originally seems as chaotic creates a pattern. This pattern results in the Collatz curve. To understand the curve, we must look at the point where it stops curving, and becomes a straight line. The pattern works up until you get to the flat part. But if we convert the fractions to decimals, and then round them, we get the pattern we were looking for. The Collatz curve for the odd numbers, is similar to the even number curve, as the odd numbers are linked to the even numbers. Where they differ is, when on the even curve, the straight bit goes to the next adjoining column. The odd curve straight bit goes from branch to branch, or over two columns. Otherwise, they are the same. Early on, when I was exploring Collatz, I tried to make an orbit table, but with just the odd numbers. It was then I hit an overwhelming problem. Take 5, I process it through 3n plus 1 and get 16. But how many times do I divide by 2 to get the next odd number? That would be 4 times. But, if we pick any random odd number like 469, what would it be? turns out to be 7. Programmers have it easy. They can write a loop that will spit out the odd number. I do not know how to make a loop in a spreadsheet. As far as I know it is not even possible. What I did know was how to do an evaluation with if statements. What I wanted is to write a formula that would cover everything I would be evaluating instead of thousands of individual formulas for each one. The problem was how many embedded if statements would I need? This problem turned out to be the best thing that could have happened to me. The absolute best. Why? Because if I was a programmer this question would have never come up, but now I was forced to answer it. For three days I panicked. How in the world was I going to figure this out? Then I came up with an idea. The idea seemed far-fetched at the time, but I did not have anything else to try. Remember this? Did not seem all that important before, but this was going to be just the answer I was looking for. Numbers on the trunk are the lowest even numbers in the column. Take for example 64. We know how many times to divide by 2 to get to 1, by just looking at the exponent. In fact, all the even numbers in that column can be divided the same number of times to reach an odd number. 960 is a large number, but dividing by 2 just 6 times gets us to 15. Turns out, it works well. Very well. These rules may not be expressed in the most eloquent manner, and I am sorry for that, but let me show you what they mean. Here, we have picked the branch point 64 from the trunk. Identified its power of 2, which is 2 to the power of 6. And its associated branch, 
21. Here, are all the odd numbers up to, and including, 21. In this example, we will be using the number 15, as it is the best example from this group. This, is the horizontal calculation table. Its purpose is to show how many divisions of 2 are required to get to the next odd number. Now, we identify that all even numbers will be divided a maximum of 6 times. Here is our barrier in place. No even number in 15's orbit should exceed it. Now, we know this works for 21, so let me show it to you first. 21, on the even number table, would look like this. This, is how you calculate 21 on the horizontal calculation table. Notice that none of the even numbers exceed the barrier. But, what do we do about the odd number? Well, let me show you. As you can see, it works. But more importantly it works for all odd numbers up to, and including, 21. Remember, this same method works on any branch on the trunk. For what I want to show you next, we must put the odd numbers in numerical order. These three numbers lie outside of the Collatz curve. While the Collatz curve can identify a vertical barrier, it cannot provide us with a horizontal barrier. In order to find the horizontal barrier, we must find the largest odd number in any orbit. Finding a reliable way to identify that number will give us the horizontal barrier. And, we might just have that, but more on that later. So why does the hailstone boundary work? It comes down to larger numbers being captured in an orbit. Here are a select set to prove my point. Notice how 3's orbit captures 5, a number larger than itself. This action happens constantly. Let's compare it to how primes collect numbers. We start with 2, and it collects all the numbers divisible by 2. With all the even numbers collected we move on to the next prime number 3. It collects all the numbers divisible by 3. We go to the next prime, 5, and it collects more numbers. The same with 7. Each prime adds more and more numbers. This is called the snowball effect. This does not happen with collats. What happens here is more analogous to the knock-on effect. Where there is uncertainty on which odd numbers, and how many, will be affected, or even if any odd number would be affected at all. Let's look at the next odd number that has not been captured, 7. It captures three numbers larger than itself. But, if we look at the next odd number that has not been captured, 9. No new numbers are captured. This also happens constantly. Let's look at our new favorite, 15. And the famous, and infamous, number 27. 27 captures 38 numbers larger than itself. Of which 36 are new numbers. This mix of capturing old and new numbers is the most common example of how numbers are captured. If you read from bottom to top, 1, 5, 3. 1, 5, 13. 1, 5, 53, what you are getting is different branches from the same limb. Or, different jump points from branch 5. 15's orbit of, 1, 5, 53, 
35, 23, is the same as 27's orbit, but instead of branching at 15, 27 branches at 61. These numbers were specially selected for this example. Why? If we look at the branches on the trunk some are dead branches, some are not captured, and some are captured. If we go in numerical order 3 captures 5, 75 captures 85, and 151 captures 341. But these four numbers are not captured, and it was for this reason they were selected. Then I had a second worry. We know that for the powers of 2, the larger the number, the greater the branch point, and greater the branch. What was unclear was this. Could a branch be less than an adjoining branch point, and if not how close could it get? Luckily, there seems to be a relationship between these two numbers, and the larger the numbers the closer to the limit they are. More importantly this works for all branches, and not just the trunk. Back to the example. And for this section when I say, numbers, I am only speaking about odd numbers. What if I asked you, how many of the numbers between 1365, and 5461, have orbits greater than 2 to the power of 12, what would your guess be? Just to be fair, I will tell you that the orbit of 27 captures 5 numbers greater than 1365. The smallest of that group is 1367, and the largest is 3077. The answer is none of them. All the numbers have either been captured or their orbits do not go beyond 2 to the power of 12. So, 5461 is the first number whose orbit exceeds 2 to the power of 12. Also, 5461 is the branch for 2 to the power of 14th on the trunk. Which mean once you multiply it by 3, and add 1, you have the branch point, and once you start dividing by 2 you are on an express elevator to 1. Why is that important? It means 5461 does not capture any new numbers. So, no branch on the trunk will capture new numbers. Let's try a different tactic. This time we want to know how many numbers greater than 1365, and up to, and including, 21,845 have orbits greater than 2 to the power of 12. The answer is, 3. Of the 3, 2 are branches from the trunk, 5,461, and 21,845. The other number, 13,653 captures no numbers larger than itself. I am going to give you the next odd number, whose orbit is greater than 2 to the power of 12. If you haven't spotted it already, there is a pattern to this. This pattern only applies to 2 to the power of 12. A greater power will have a greater spacing, and of course a smaller power will have a smaller spacing. With 2 to the power of 18th, there is a difference of 86,016, half of which are even. So, 43,008 odd numbers. The question is, how many have orbits that are greater than 2 to the power of 12? Well, you can actually count them. 11. Let's try something much larger, 2 to the power of 26th. Again, how many of these odd numbers have orbits greater than 2 to the power of 12? Out of the 11,184,128 possible numbers, only a meager 2,731. Not even 1%, but approximately 0.02%. The question was, how many odd numbers have orbits greater than 2 to the power of 12? The important part of the question was about the orbits. Remember we chose these numbers on purpose. They allow the example to be clear, and uncluttered, from extraneous information that would just cause confusion. 
while the example may not be confusing, these statements might be, but they are important. The branch at 2 to the power of 12, is 1365. I am not saying 1365, and all the odd numbers less than it, captures all numbers bound by 2 to the power of 12, as there is only a finite amount of numbers captured by them. What I am saying is there are infinitely many numbers whose orbits are bound by 2 to the power of 12, due to the dispersal of the collats numbers. Here is 2 to the power of 12. When we draw in the hailstone boundary, it divides the table. While the even number table show us the dispersal of the numbers, this does not help us understand a number's orbit. For that we must use the Collatz curve. Look closely at the numbers between the hailstone boundary and the Collatz curve. We can plainly see that only one number whose orbit is greater than 2 to the power of 12. We can again apply it to 2 to the power of 16. This time we have three numbers with orbits greater than 2 to the power of 12. And for 2 to the power of 18. We have 11 numbers with orbits greater than 2 to the power of 12. You are doubtlessly asking yourself the reason I am showing you this. Simply stated, this shows why the hailstone boundary conjecture works. Unfortunately, it is only a working model as we do not understand how captured numbers truly work. But we will. I think mathematicians have been mistranslating Paul Erdos, and his now famous quote. The bad translation is. Mathematics is not ready to solve the Collatz conjecture. They inferred this to mean that a new branch of mathematics would have to be discovered in order to solve the conjecture. I think a better translation to be. Mathematicians, are not ready to solve the Collatz conjecture. Inferring that that they should stick to the KISS principle. I am referring to the KISS principle as it was originally defined, and not by the newer, politically correct, versions. Let's face it I am no math genius, so I had to keep it simple, and my path to discovery started with two simple questions. Which numbers go forward, and which numbers go backwards? So, what was the reason that caused me to ask these questions? Because, I was interested in how the dispersal affected the directionality. Please note, I am going out of the order of discovery so that this makes more sense. Now, can you guess how all the Collatz numbers are distributed? Hindsight being 2020, it becomes very obvious. Half of the numbers are in the first column, a remaining quarter are in the second column. The last quarter, covers all the rest. Notice, I took care to say all numbers. All even numbers, or all odd numbers, are an infinite set. Finite sets will get you a near approximation, but works best when using sets that are exceedingly larger than the branch being evaluated. Remember, we know that half of numbers, whether even or odd, are all in column 1, which means the remaining half are in the columns to the right. If we include the next column, we added one fourth more numbers. One half plus one fourth equals three fourths with one fourth remaining in the columns to the right. Think of it more like this. I had one half, and add one fourth, and have one fourth remaining. If I add another one eighth, I have one eighth remaining. Add another 1 16th with a 1 16th remaining, and so forth. This goes a long way in explaining why we have increasingly diminishing orbits. So, what do I mean by forwards and backwards? When we select an odd number, we process it till it reaches the next odd number. 
if that number is greater than the original, we consider the original number as going forward. On the other hand, if that number is less than the original, we consider the original number as going backwards. Here we selected 3. 3 goes to 10, which goes to 5. 3 has gone forward to 5. According to Collatz this is bad as it is heading away from 1. We will now do the same for 5. 5 goes to 16. 5 has gone backwards to 1. According to Collatz we want numbers to go in this direction, as this should lead us back to 1. If you end up with a number less than the starting number, this is good, green, and if you end up with a number greater, this is bad, red. The Collatz conjecture, is notoriously difficult for finding patterns. Which is why mathematicians are encouraged to abandon any attempt trying to solve it. Now, I know it is going to be very, very, difficult, but if you look closely, very closely, you may spot the pattern. Just do not be upset if you cannot find it. Ready, go. Oh, maybe that was not so difficult after all. 3 went forward to 5, so 3 is colored red. 5 went backwards to 1, so 5 is colored green. Note that 1 is white, as it goes neither forward or backwards, 1 goes to 1, but if we take a little liberty with the wording, and state that 1 goes back to itself, we can color it green and complete the pattern. So, now we have answered the questions, which go forward, and which go backwards. According to Professor Tao, there is another question we must answer. If we let n equal 1, 3 times 1 equals 3. If we add 1, we will get 4. If we subtract 1, we will get 2. On the even number table, this change would shift it one column to the left. Of course, this is an obvious, and well-known fact. It is not enough to answer Professor Tao's question, as this seems like a mere trivial change. But, for any answer to be true, it must be true for all instances of these equations. The first thing we must do, is think of 3n plus 1 as, positive 3, times positive n, plus positive 1. If we change any one element of the equation negative, we get the following equations. If we change any two elements of the equation negative, we get the following equations. If we change all elements of the equation negative, we get the following equation. The problem now is, some of these equations produce negative results, but if we use their absolute value all results are positive. The effect of this is, all equations to the left generate exactly, the same data as 3n-1, and all equations to the right generate exactly, the same data as 3n-1. As a result, all the equations to the right comply with the Collatz conjecture, whereas all the ones on the left do not. Again, this is already known, and does not answer Professor Tao's question. Look at the blank spaces between the branch points. These become the branch points for 3n-1. Everything shifts to the left one column. Just as we predicted. The problem is you do not see the truth. Why? Because of a problem I call data clutter. Remember at the beginning I stated that, the problem with running a program, or getting a dump from a database, is that is hard to see how to organize the raw data in a meaningful way. This is raw data. If you look closely, 
you will recognize the first number is the number being evaluated. The other numbers, are that number's orbit. Being unorganized it is hard to see any meaningful information about the Collatz conjecture, and this has always been the problem. But once you understand its relation to the even number table, things become suddenly clear. That 3n-1, actually creates the same pattern as 3n-1, but is shifted 3 columns to the left. Like before, 3, goes to 10, then goes to 5, and 5, goes to 16, then goes to 1. But with 3n-1, 3 now goes to 2, then goes to 1, and 5, goes to 14, then goes to 7. When you do compare the two equations, there is a complete change in directionality. Our question is, are our findings enough to satisfy Professor Tao? And if not, why not? With those questions answered, they lead to the next question. How are they dispersed? What we are doing here, is processing the number and dividing it by two as many times necessary to get an odd number. The number of times we divide by two will indicate the column. When we are done processing, we look back at the chart to determine if there is a pattern. Ready. Yup, that just happened. Just so you understand what is going on, like any tree you can have a branch coming off another branch. In this case 3. Branches from 5. At column 1. We knew that half the numbers would be in column 1. What we did not know was that when we based the numbers on their directionality, that all the forward numbers would be in column 1. Which in turn means, that all the backwards numbers fill the rest of the columns. We are going to do the same process as before, but this time we know there should be no backwards numbers in column 1. Notice, there is a set of numbers in column 2 starting with 1, and in another in column 3 starting with 5. That the columns go 1, 5, 1, 5, 1, 5, and continue doing so infinitely. I call these the candy stripe numbers. Note, to get to the next number you must move down two rows. Look at the column label. It is 2 to the power of 2. If we subtract 1 from the power, we are left with 2 to the power of 1 which, when calculated, is 2. The reason I point this out is, to show how rapidly the gaps grow between numbers. Here are the formulas for the candy stripe numbers. Notice that for set 1, you subtract 5, and for set 5, you subtract 1. Now, we are looking at row spacing between same sets. I cannot show the spacing for set 5, but I can write out both sets for you. See if you can determine any relationship between set 5 and set 1. Yeah, that one is a bit more difficult to spot, so we will have to come back to that later. But you should be able to recognize this. Some may be confused with set 5, as it starts with the number 13. This is because 3 is a forward number. 
Here is what the distribution looks like. But I think it is best view from a different perspective. Here you see a sea of green. It is hard to believe, that half of all odd numbers are in column 1, but if you believe in yin yang, then there should be a time when you will see a sea of red with a sliver of green, and you will. The reason I did not mention this before, was because I did not wish to distract from showing you the number distribution. Here we are again, but this time we will look at forward propagation. Kind of a unique pattern wouldn't you say? The reason I showed you that, was because once you know how the Collatz numbers are distributed, if you cannot find a pattern, you are just not looking. Granted, most patterns are trivial, but still. Remember this? 5 jumps back to 1. If all numbers jump backwards, we could easily prove the conjecture, but we know this is not the case. 3 jumps forward to 5. One of the things that could prove Collatz wrong is numbers jumping forward indefinitely. But, are there numbers that do multiple jumps forward? Turns out we do not have to look very long to find out. I built this table, to show how numbers were jumping. The 10 numbers in the middle are the numbers we are evaluating. The numbers to the left, and right, show the jump series they are a part of. But, if they have a number to their left, I can ignore that number as it is already part of a series. Instead, I wanted to try and identify the start of each new jump series. More importantly, I wanted to understand when things happened for the first time, and then look for a pattern. 1, does not jump. But when does it make the first jump? Obviously, at 3. But when does it jump twice in a row? 7. And we continue this process. And when you look carefully, there is a pattern. 1 times 2, plus 1 equals 3, 3 times 2, plus 1 equals 7, 7 times 2, plus 1 equals 15, etc. This pattern goes on indefinitely. This collection of numbers I call a jump family, with 1 being the head of the family. Looking closely, you will see not all numbers are included in this family. Take 9 for example. 9, does not jump. 9, is more like 1. And when you apply the generation sequence formula, you realize you found another jump family. The same goes for 13. In fact, there are an infinite number of jump families. I could not find a formula that represented the sequence for the head of the families, but there is a pattern. This, is jump family 1. Remember earlier, I promised you a sea of red? Well, this pattern applies to all jump families, and there are infinitely many jump families. Some people hate this format. They argue that generation 0 has one number assigned to it, so naturally it should be called gen 1. I have two reasons for not doing that. First, the generation matches the number of jumps. Second, when manipulating the data, generation 0 becomes a header, identifying which jump family we are working with. The remaining generations match the row numbers. Generation 1 is row 1. 
Generation 2, is row 2. You have seen this formula before, it is the generation sequence formula, but it is more special than you might think. Why? Because it is the same formula regardless of the column. This is the diagonal formula, and the same applies. Of course, these principles apply to all jump families. Now, I do not claim to be the first person to find jump family 1. We may never know who did, but here is an example of someone who did. Here is the problem. His equations for generating the leads and the diagonals, only works for jump family 1. So, it seems likely that he was unaware of all the other jump families. Or, maybe he did know. But why tell you this? Because, like the title states, little known, or undocumented facts. The first column, the 10 column, is the backward jumping numbers. For the second column, if we bulldozed all of the candy stripe columns into one column, we would get a column that looked like this. The third column is, the difference between the first and second. The fourth column is, the quotient from dividing the third column by the first and converting it to a percentage. Okay, I know someone will point out, that if the goal is to get to 1, and that 5 jumps to 1, did it not jump 100% of the way? Yes, yes it did, but it creates a problem. It is far easier to fix the problem by making an exception to all the numbers along the trunk, rather than manipulating all the other branches, thus it stays. Also, this exception provides an insight which I will disclose in a moment. For each appearance of a candy stripe number, it gets closer to 100%. Okay, so what does that mean? Take 1, it starts off at 80%. The next appearance of 1 gets even closer. And, while not shown here, the next appearance of 1 is at 85 which is the next branch of the trunk, and it is even closer to 100%. This happens for all the candy stripe numbers. But, here are the only three numbers that you really need to know. Any backward jumping number that is not on the trunk, will fall into one of these three categories. In full disclosure, you need to know the following. Notice there is a gap between the 20-ish numbers, and 60-ish numbers. And the gap between the 60-ish, and 80-ish? Well, that pattern continues infinitely. It goes from 80, to 90, to 95, to 97, to 98, to 99, to 99.9, to 99.99, to 99.999, etc. That all sounds great, until you take a different point of view. By looking at the header, otherwise known as Generation 0, we can identify this as Jump Family 1. Gen 1, equals row 1, and so forth. Column A, uses the generation sequence formula to identify the first number of each generation. Column B, uses the diagonal formula to identify the last number of each generation. Column C is, where column B jumps to. The columns A slash B, C slash B, define movement. A slash B, looks at how much movement forward has happened, 
and C slash B, is movement backwards. The elements highlighted blue and yellow is when movement backward exceeds movement forward. This looks grim, but it is not. You need to take a deep dive into the numbers to understand why. That, you can do on your own, as it would be a whole separate video topic. Now, I am going to give you the same data, but without displaying the three middle columns. For full disclosure, look at the bottom half of column 45. There you will see percentages of 25 and 62.5. These are the limits for a number jumping backwards. I allowed rounding so it would clearly show the data point when limits were virtually achieved. It made finding them easier. Also note that this was applied for all three limits. If you are in the camp for disproving the Collatz conjecture, this data looks compelling. If we look at just the A B columns, or blue columns, we get trends by row. As the row numbers get bigger, the closer to reaching a virtual upper limit of 100%. But, and this is a big but, remember that exception for the trunk for numbers going backwards? While numbers jumping forward will reach a virtual 100%, the numbers on the trunk actually go backwards 100% of the way. And that makes a world of difference. Again, this is jump family one, but I do not want you to think of jump families like this. Instead, I want you to think of them like this. Looking at them like branches, give you a better perspective on what is going on. Look at the middle of your screen, and find the number 405. Notice that below it are the numbers 101 and 25. Remember, 101 and 25 are branches bypassed by 405 on its way to 19. 405 jumps to 19. 19 jumps forward and goes to 29. Here, you calculate to find that 29 is on branch 11 and the path continues till you are back at 1 Here is the important part. All numbers have two properties, they are part of a generation, and they are a branch for a generation. And while each number has two properties, each property is only used once. Look at how all the branches, of branch 19, jump to 29. Well, the truth is, all the branches from this generation jump at 29. But look at the number 9, it has no branches, but it still jumps. Both 29, and 9, become a set of branches that jump at 17. Which means, there is only one path between generations. And while another generation may have a similar path, no two generations have the same path. F, stands for jump family. G, stands for generation. This can be confusing as we have been using the numbers for the generation so I will temporarily put them back. 
9, jump to 7, then 11, then 17. On the other hand, 29, jump to 11, then 17. This is how you get the hailstone effect. Numbers jumping in the middle of a generation create the hailstone effect. This is a typical number path, or regular number path. In contrast, 17, jumps to 13, then to 5, then to 1. This is an atypical number path, or a perfect number path. This happens when the last number of a generation jumps to the branch of the last number of a different generation. Perfect number paths act as lighting rods heading to 1. Generationally speaking, we only care which generation is linked to the next generation. But there is one slight problem. We cannot make a generational tree showing all these paths. Why? Because there are infinitely many branches for each generation. Unfortunately, I cannot take my research much past this point. There was a reason why I was using spreadsheets. Which is also why I must turn over my research to you. While it is my hope that you will carry on the research, I'm afraid that you will go back to doing the same old routine. Thus, I fear two things may happen. We must understand generational orbits, this is important. But using generational orbits to study generational hailstoning I fear will lead nowhere. Also, using generational orbits to generate generational stop times I find even less useful. I think there is a better way, and have an idea on how best to proceed. If I oversaw the direction that research should take, I would try to prove these two hypotheses. But why? I think the conjecture can be proven, if these two hypotheses hold true. But, I know what you are thinking. What the heck is the generational boundary hypothesis? Well, I am about to tell you. Again, this may not be the best way to state the hypothesis, so it's better if I show you. Like the hailstone boundary hypothesis, we will start with the third jump point on the trunk, branch 21. Like before, all numbers equal to, or less than 21, will be within the boundary. And like before, 5, 3, and 1 need not be included as they are covered by other branches, but are included anyways. The first thing we do, is calculate the lead numbers from jump family 1. Next, we find the first lead number greater than 21, 31. And identify the associated generation, G4 and we have found our generational boundary. Please note, while we know the generational boundary, we cannot identify how many families will be required to contain an orbit. If you like, you can pause the video, and check all numbers up to, and including 21. Why is the generational boundary important? Remember how the hailstone boundary gave us the vertical boundary? The generational boundary gives us the missing horizontal boundary. Because we have proven all even numbers will reach an odd number, we start with the stipulation that your orbit starts with an odd number. Remember the hailstone boundary, gives us the greatest power of two that cannot be exceeded by a number's orbit, and the generational boundary gives us the largest generation that cannot be exceeded by a number's orbit. Better stated, the hailstone boundary contains all the even numbers, and the generational boundary contains all the odd numbers, for the orbit of x.
Together they can contain any orbit, thus if we can prove the hailstone boundary hypothesis, and the generational boundary hypothesis, we can prove the Collatz conjecture. But, for curiosity's sake, let's say we can prove both hypotheses. Many math purists may state that, it is like measuring the hailstone boundary in yards, and the generational boundary in meters, but unlike yards and meters, the hailstone boundary, and the generational boundary do not have a conversion formula. They would say that in order to prove the Collatz conjecture, a way to convert will be needed to be found. My response to that is, you are using the wrong analogy. A better analogy would be longitude and latitude. There is no conversion between longitude and latitude. But calculating both lets you know exactly where you stand. The same applies to the hailstone boundary, and the generational boundary. It lets you know where you stand with the Collatz conjecture. If it is not already obvious, all the forward numbers, jump to numbers created by using the compressed notation, and all the backward numbers, jump to numbers created by using the optimally compressed notation. Because of these facts, the backward numbers are less predictable. All we really know for sure, is that, we will be dividing by two, two or more times. How many more times? Well, that is what makes them unpredictable. Forward numbers on the other hand, are divided by two only once, thus making them very predictable. That being said, do you remember this? I tried to pass it off as some trivial piece of information. But with everything collats, even the seemingly trivial requires a deeper look. Let's look at the numbers, and what they represent. Let's rearrange our original formula for C. Keeping the formula for B in mind, let's look at just A and C. Using just this data, can you determine a formula for C? Your formula is likely this. Just out of curiosity's sake, what would happen if we applied it to the backward numbers? Well, mathematically this was expected. But the data shows that if we were to pick a random odd number, we could use this formula to determine directionality. If the resulting number is even, it is a forward number, and if it is odd, it is a backward number. Honestly, as for the direction formula, I don't know how useful it is. Most of us would simply use the Collatz function to determine directionality while also producing useful data like, where does it jump to? That being said, we can make use of it as a substitution for C. Now, I have to stop here for a minute. Technically this should be called the jump forward formula. Which implies there should be a jump backward formula. And there is. Using the same observational method, we can come up with this formula. How useful this formula is, is questionable. Its true usefulness will have to be determined by you. I only provided it under the guise of full disclosure. The jump formula on the other hand could be very useful. When using it to generate jump families, it might be more efficient. For an example, let's use jump family 169. Using the generation sequence formula, we can generate all the lead numbers from each generation. We will choose the lead number from generation 9. and start calculating the first jump. Here is what I want to point out. With the compressed notation we basically have to triple our starting number before dividing by 2. 
whereas with the jump formula we just add a digit before dividing by 2. My big assumption is it takes more processing power when using the compressed notation. Along with that, I am also assuming that in real world terms, the actual time difference to process each is a mere microscopic difference. With that said, I do perceive two limits which would affect our ability to continue calculating jump families. Processing power, and floating decimal point errors. Here is our starting number. And here is the result. If we continue the calculations, it would end like this. When calculating the last number using the jump formula, due to the embedded direction formula, we have to stop the calculation when we discover it is a backward number. Whereas when we get to the end using compressed notation, we can just continue with the optimally compressed notation, by simply looping division by 2. But to me, it makes much more sense, that, when we reach a backwards number we stop, and start the next generation. I believe it would be smarter to calculate where each generation jumps separately. By using the diagonal formula, along with the optimally compressed notation, I think would be a better way to do the job. Mainly because this could be done in parallel on a separate machine. Unfortunately, we will eventually hit one of our limitations. Let's assume for this example, that it happens when we achieve results equal to, or greater than, 10 million. Using the compressed notation, we reach this as soon as we multiply by 3. Advantage to the jump formula? Maybe not so much. Let me explain why. Look at the generation sequence formula, and the diagonal formula. One you multiply by 2, and the other by 3. This gives a clear indication when you are likely to reach the limit, when using the jump formula. So, is it a case of too little, too late, for the jump formula? That is for you to decide. Where I think there is an advantage for the jump formula, is over time. Let's go back to my first big assumption, that the jump formula is fractionally faster than using the compressed notation. My second big assumption is that, while all modern computers may suffer some lag time when crunching large numbers, they can still do so accurately up until they reach a point of creating a floating decimal point error. If these assumptions are true, I think the jump formula is a better fit for generating jump families. Meaning that you generate jump family 1, until you reach its limit. Where you immediately start working on jump family 9, again until you reach its limit and move on to jump family 13 then 21 and so forth the more jump families you can complete over a consecutive period of time can be done faster using the jump formula for many this section may seem unnecessary, but because of the different mathematical skill levels of the viewers of this video, this section has been added to be more inclusive. For 1. The first jump point is at 4. Or 2 to the power of 2. By dividing the power of 2, by 2, gives you the jump point number. For 5. The first jump point is at 10 or 2 to the power of 1. The method of dividing the power of 2, by 2 does not work. We need to take a closer look. Here is the problem. When we divide odd powers of 2, by 2, we end up with a remainder, but if we take the time to reimagine this, it becomes our solution. The thing is, 
it would be nice if we had one method for both even and odd powers of two. Technically, they are the same method. Having just one method, helps those viewers that have programming skills. As you can see, this is Jump Family 9, and we stopped at Generation 1. Let's assume the only thing we know is that 29 is our starting number, and we need to figure out its Jump Family, Generation, and Position. We are going to do that by pretending that we don't already know the answer. But since we are cheating, we know that to go from 19, to 29, we use the jump formula, or, as in this case, the compressed notation. Since this is an iterated process, we come up with a new value for n. We started with a blue n of 19, and after processing, we came up with a new value, purple n, which is 29. Our goal is to reverse this process, and find the value of blue n. We substitute the value of purple n with 29. Then calculate the results. In order to be correct, the result must be a whole number, and it must be an odd number. Which it is. Since this is an iterated process, we must continue. But this time our results is not a whole odd number, so we stop. The last whole odd number was 19. Which means 19 is the lead number for this generation, and therefore in position 1. We completed two calculations, of which only one was completed correctly. By adding 1 to the number of correct calculations, gives us the position. Therefore, we know that 29 is in position 2. For this next part we need to do a similar process, but this time we need to use the generation sequence formula. Again, we reverse the formula. During our determination of 29's position, we discovered that 19 was the lead number for this generation. So, we start there. After doing the calculations, we again must get a result that is a whole number, and an odd number, which it is. Again, this is an iterated process, so we must continue. This time our results is a whole number, but it is not an odd number, so we stop. The last whole odd number was 9. Which means 9 is the head of the family, and thus generation 0. Again, we completed two calculations, with one completed correctly. The number completed correctly is equal to the generation number. Therefore, we know that 29, is in generation 1. Consequently, because we know the head of the family, we have everything we need for the number 29. 29, is part of jump family 9, in generation 1, at position 2. Another way to find its position, is to start with the jump backwards formula. We do the calculation. Get a proper result. Iterate the process. But before we can finish, we get an invalid result and therefore must stop. Both the jump backwards formula, and the reversed compressed notation, get the same results, but is there an advantage of one over the other? It remains to be seen. Up until now, I have been showing you how to recreate my work with spreadsheets. Along the way, I also expressed how programmers may replicate this data, but without the restrictions I faced with spreadsheets. Nevertheless, 
I still feel there is a better way to look at the data. There is a small fraction of viewers that have a distinct equipped skill set to accomplish it. 1. They are extremely proficient programmers. 2. They are exceedingly skilled with databases. 3. Know how to write a program to efficiently populate a database. While there may be only a few of them, I do not discourage others from trying as learning a new skill set can be beneficial to anyone. Upon reflection, I should have added the power of two associated to the evaluated number. The simplest way would be, after calculating the branch point, counting the number of times you have to divide by two, to get the branch it is a member of. As we demonstrated, knowing this number will help determine the jump point. It is my hope that, Creating such a database, would go a long way to verifying both the hailstone boundary hypothesis, and the generational boundary hypothesis. I truly believe the answer to this question is no. I suspect claims, and counterclaims, will come out of the woodworks, of who knew what, and when. I will leave it to the mathematical community to sort it out. Of course, that is all dependent whether I am right or not. All the data is out there for you to judge. This does not solve the Collatz conjecture, but puts us on a possible path to solve it. That being said, we have some big problems. Both the hailstone boundary hypothesis, and the generational boundary hypothesis are built on observations, and must be proven. But the problem goes deeper than that. In the first section, I think it would be easy to offer a mathematical proof that the dispersal of collats even and odd numbers follow the structure of the even number table. I believe that I provided proof of that in this video. The problems lie in the advanced section of the video. Where all the conclusions are based on observations, which are built on observations, built on observations. Just like collats, where we observe all numbers go to 1 we cannot provide a mathematical proof that all numbers go to 1. Remember, I told you that all the odd numbers are alternating between jumping forwards and backwards. I observed that, but cannot provide a mathematical proof of it. The same problems exist for all the observations I presented. This is where, if he was alive, Professor Erdos would be yelling at us, did you really think it would be that easy, and laughing at us. Now, I have to be honest, there is another reason I made this video. I am hoping to get you to watch my next video. The irrational number line hypothesis, while a simple concept, might be the one hypothesis that most mathematicians agree to be true, but also agree it can never be proven, due to the incredibly impossible effort required for this undertaking. Collatz Advanced is my first video, and it literally took months to make. I do not know when the next video will be published, but more videos are coming. So, if you do subscribe, using the bell notification is highly recommended.